That's great. I think it's so amazing that you've gotten to this place where you feel so confident you're doing something so completely new for yourself. I mean, I think um, obviously it's really hard when you're with a band that's such, it's so high profile. People have very specific expectations. And I'm kind of wondering, actually, just to rewind a little, um, maybe we could talk just a little bit about how you got the guys together for Angels and Airwaves, because obviously you're coming from a situation where it was a really specific chemistry and so now, you know, who do you play music with next? And how did that come together? <clears throat> well, yeah, that was hard. I mean, I loved uh, I loved sharing a stage with Mark and Travis. They were like, Travis is the best drummer in the entire world. Mark is just like electric, you know. And, and you know, there was a time, for a long period of time, the reason I started playing music with Mark is like you never knew what he was going to do. I mean, that guy, I mean, whether he's going to take off all of his clothes or he's going to start running circles around the people. I mean, it was incredible. It was so funny, you know. Um, but it's not what I was looking for, for Angels and Airways. I didn't want the best musicians in the world. I didn't want um, guys that I thought would add some crazy persona to stage. It's, it was a different thing. My absolute intent and, and idea with this band was was kind of, you know, it wasn't a parallel to Blink. With Blink, people go, what's your message? What are you guys trying to go? We well, fuck, we don't have a message. We don't care. You know, fuck this, fuck that. We do what we want. Uh, with Angels and Airwaves, it's absolute message. And it's it's absolute, um, you know, uh, the idea of absolute thinking and, and positivity, you know. So the people that I do it with have to understand that and have to be cool with that, and and to understand that and be cool with that, they have to be good people, um, and they have to be able to play in a team, and they have to be able to work for something that's larger than themselves. And so when I, I had people calling me from big bands like all over the country too, like shit that I, I was tripping on, kind of you know, like that they wanted to play with me, and I was like, whoa, I, it was really an honor, you know, but um, it wasn't what I was looking for. I didn't want a super group. You know, I needed something that was organic. I needed something that felt like it was bubbling inside of someone's garage and was about ready to explode all over the face of the earth rather than like, hey, I got some big names and we're going to be big, you know. So uh, I met some of these people and as I would talk to them, the first thing wasn't about what kind of music they liked and the first thing wasn't about how long they've been playing their instrument. It was always about um, I was laying out rules how this band is to operate and the first one was absolute respect for the band members that you're with and absolute respect for their families and the second rule would be like you know um the ability to grow into a really hard you know predestined friendship you know the idea of like do you see yourself loving your bandmates and wanting to be with them and enjoying the environment you know that kind of stuff so it's really it's really an odd conversation that you wouldn't expect to be in a band but I guess with my experience and what I've been through, um, I'm looking for something different. And then, then we would get around to like, okay, well, what kind of music are you into? What, you, what kind of music? It would, then I'll, actually, I would be like, if you had your absolute perfect situation, what kind of music would you hope to be playing in front of? If you had 50,000 people a night watching you, what kind of music would you want to play every single song in front of those people? You know, so it. Some people would be like, "Oh, I just want to play like reggae jazz stuff," or some people might say, oh, "I'll play some really heavy, like what you know, you know." It's like it's always interesting because in Blink, we had like uh, you know we've been around for twelve years and we sold millions and millions of records and a lot of all those songs we really liked playing live. Most of the songs were singles, singles that we didn't really want to be singles that we have to play every single night. So most of your show, you don't really like half the songs you're playing, but you have to play them, you know. And uh, when I wrote the songs for this record, I. I I uh, I planned out how I want them. I will. I want every song to be something I will never ever want to stop playing live. You know, every song is something. It's built for a live show. Every single song I built in my head, I'd close my eyes and say, "How should this song start?" And I'd picture the production because I have a lot of experience playing on these big stages with lights and screens and pyrotechnics. And so I was like, "I'm all. All these songs need to be able to be visualized on stage before they ever go in, into the you know recording gear." So. That's wild because it's kind of. I mean, people usually talk about it kind of the other way around. Every oh, everyone right? talks about the other way around. Even when you record a song, people record drums first and then you do everything else. I recorded the song first and we did drums last. Everything was backwards, and that's why I think it's so good because I saw where I wanted to go. I saw how I wanted to play. I saw how I wanted the production to be, and I saw how 
I wanted the message to be conveyed, and then we did it, and then we packaged it up, put the drums on it, and then it's like it's like it was really cr- crazy, and it was perfectly, perfectly thought out. Were, there, were you suddenly? Did you find that you were kind of pulling out albums that you hadn't listened to in a long time, or listening to new stuff? Was was there? Music in the background for you while while oh, yeah. you started writing that was kind of maybe some of its secrets. Stuff. The only the <laughs> only the only stuff I would even allow myself to listen to the only stuff would be the biggest and best stuff in the world. The stuff that I believed was timeless. Like I would I would grab a band and go, how did they become the biggest band in the world and why are they there and what do they do in their career? What do they know that I don't know? Because then when Blink, when we did our last Blink record, I really truly felt it was a, like a masterpiece for punk rock music. There's no to this date, there is no punk rock band that's ever made a record like that. And I don't care who says that. I I we worked a year on that record, and that was one of the best rock records of oh, when I, I I know it for a fact. And and people to this day keep coming up to me. I mean Robert Smith from The Cure knew when he when he sang on it. And he told us he's like. In England, he was like, the, the, the first 20 minutes of that record, I reckon, is the best 20 minutes of a rock record in the past 20 years. He was saying all this rad shit. It was awesome to hear him say it. And I'm not trying to brag right now, but we're fucking awesome. No. <laughs> but, <clears throat> but, that, but that record still sold about four some million copies or whatever, and, which is a hell of a lot because now people don't buy records. I mean, it probably would have equated to about eight or nine million, I guess, if it came out like seven years ago. But uh, I sat around and I said, okay, but how do I get bigger than that? Like, what do I need to learn and do differently than that? Because that was the best work I can do today. So, so anyways, I, I spent a long time thinking about how do I grow from that point. And so... So who were you looking to? I mean, so my answer to your question is, I ended up listening to a lot of Peter Gabriel, U2, The Police, The Cure, bands that got to like stadium level kind of stuff, uh, size. I mean, Peter Gabriel, you never really picture in stadiums, but... When you listen to Biko and Salisbury Hill and some of these like epic songs he did, it's empowering. It's the stuff that gives you chills, like in your eyes when John Cusack's holding up the ghetto blaster and saying anything, you know? It's like it gives you the chills and it makes you feel like you're being transported to a place. And uh, that's, that's how I worked and that's what I did. And I wouldn't listen to any independent rock bands, no cool punk rock bands, no like already like... Radiohead type bands. It was, that's not when my that wasn't even none of it was good enough for me. Like the only thing that was good enough for me is I wanted to learn from bands, and it's not even just because I thought they were the biggest bands. I truly thought they were the greatest bands. I mean, I can listen to the Police all day long and always go, "How do they write a song like Every Breath You Take?" You know, I can listen to U2 all day long. Go, "How do they?" I mean, I can list off thirty songs by them that I go, "How the heck did they, you know? How the fuck did they do that?" Um, and Peter Gabriel, the same thing. There's and just certain, I have like a handful of bands, that's all I would listen to. And they were my favorite ones out of all the sh- I can't still listen to like, you know, the Descendants and Bad Religion punk rock bands, even though I put on Bad Religion yesterday and I was freaked out. I was like, fuck, I haven't heard this in so long. I lo- See, when the recording was done, I put them all back on, you know. Mm-hmm. But it's, it's, it wasn't the ingredients that I wanted for my album. I was trying to do something much larger and bigger. And it's not for fame and it's not for money. It's, it's the idea of I wanted to learn how music as mathematics can touch an amazing amount of people, and then within that, I can deliver a message, you know? And it's, but it's interesting that it's, it's like you wanted to put aside the stuff that had to do with punk, and you wanted to put aside stuff that, that would be more kind of like Indian contemporary. I'm just wondering if it has to do with, um, uh, I mean, this idea of like timelessness. It's, it's funny because um, it seems like most of the new bands that come around, it's not, you don't necessarily want to listen to them because you think they're going to last forever. It's because it's a sound like right now. Oh, it's Absolutely. New Wave. Oh, it's, you know, whatever. It's- it's, that's what blows my mind. Every band out right now is dark and repeating something that's been done for the past 20 years. Like, they might grab it from 15 years ago or 10 years ago or 20 years ago. Like, you got the bands that dress up like they're from the 70s. You got the bands that dress up like they're the new wave bands and do the new wave thing. You got a band like Interpol. It's like the Joy Division thing. And I love Interpol, and that's not a dig at all. But I'm just saying it's like they're, per- like they're doing, everyone's doing this thing, you know? And they're doing their thing. And I love it, and, I, and it's needed, and it fills a perfect niche in music. And it's necessary. Uh, but for me, why would I? Coming from a band that started and was was such a, such a staple of this pop punk sound, we were the first ones to do these crazy videos. We were the first ones to kind of speak for this 
the white American suburban household. I think that's what got our our band so big. We were, the, you know, now you have your Fallout Boys and and you know My Chemical Romance.